Hello and let's talk about India's new COVID-19 records. The disease shows no sign of abating in the country. Numbers released this morning show that the total number of cases has crossed 8,78,000 with over 301,000 active cases. The number of deaths is close to 23,200. In the 24 hours preceding today morning, 28,700 new cases were reported and 500 new deaths were reported too. India continues to be in the top three countries in terms of cases in the world with the US which is over 33 lakh cases and Brazil which is over 18 lakh cases. The media has been focusing on the Bachchan family contracting COVID-19 but many more developments continue to take place. Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Gujarat, West Bengal, Bihar and Chhattisgarh all reported their single highest day infections. Stricter restrictions are in place in major cities in Maharashtra. Bangalore is set to go into lockdown from tomorrow for a week, making it the latest metro city after Chennai and Mumbai, which also took this route earlier. Recently, Uttar Pradesh too went for a 55-hour lockdown from Friday. What does the trajectory of the disease look like in India? We speak to NewsClick's Prabir Purka yesterday to find out. Thank you, Prabir, for joining us. So, you just talked about how the number of new cases continues to rise at an alarming rate. It's crossed the 25,000 mark for the past couple of days. And India is, of course, still number third, but the number of new cases, in terms of the number of new cases, it's second. So, could you first take us through what the patterns and variations are regarding the numbers, especially in the country? Well, before we go into the country itself, let's look at what we should look at in terms of the COVID-19 epidemic itself. Because as it progresses, obviously we are not talking right now of being able to stop the COVID-19 epidemic, uh, that we were not going to do what China did, stopped it in its track, or some of the other countries have also done. We are really talking now about how to cope with the pandemic and how to slow it down in a way that we can at least control the aftermath, which is that if people do fall sick, we should be able to take care of them. And we should also be able to take care of the economic consequences of the pandemic. These are the two really issues. And I must confess that when we look at the countries, it's interesting to see the three clearly right-wing strong men kind of figures who have been leading the countries, the United States, India, Brazil, are all at the, at the moment at the top and nothing seems to be stopping them. It's interesting that if you look at the US, it still has the single highest number of new infections, and it has been so for a considerable period of time. And as people are saying, they are seeing a surge when they never really saw, saw a dip. They never really saw a dip, but they're seeing a surge. Similarly, India is now the second highest new infections in the world, just after the United States. The third is Brazil. The fourth, and it's quite a bit way down, is South Africa. We were third earlier. We have now overtaken Brazil. Though Brazil is more than twice our total number of cases, it means that we are speeding up even beyond Brazil, which virtually has been functioning without any control whatsoever, except what people have done, not what the government has done. In India, in spite of the lockdown, in spite of other things that we have claimed, we still are in this particular way speeding full speed, shall we say, full speed ahead. And that's very, very disturbing that we are not in a position to really do anything about it is the picture that we seem to get. If we look at the other part, which is the government of India seems to be claiming, and ICMR is a record in saying this again and again, that we have not reached uh, community transmission. I don't know what actually they mean by community transmission. This is a new definition they have created by which they can keep on denying in community interest transmission. Clearly, we are in community transmission. We do not know who is infecting whom. And when you have a figure which is so large, as we already have, to talk about not having community transmission is just bunker. So I think the clear message is we are in community transmission, and we are in community transmission in a number of places. What are those places? Of course, we have talked about in our charts and news click, you will see we have charts which show, for instance, what are the main uh, states which are seeing this. And we are also looking at cities which are seeing the COVID-19 pandemic epidemic right. progress. And in these cities, it's interesting when you look at, for instance, say, Maharashtra, you will find that while Mumbai has slowed up somewhat, and we have figures to show that, that today Thane is going ahead. Thane is really uh, has bad figures, but even Thane is slowing down a bit. 
But if you look at, for instance, uh, you can take Pune. Pune suddenly sees a sharp rise again. After being in control for some time, it suddenly seems to show a sharp rise. And other thing that we see is there are other districts of Maharashtra which are also going, uh, if you accumulate the numbers, if you see just the new cases, I'm not talking the total cases, so I'll talk about the new cases, which show you what's happening right now, you will find that the rest of Maharashtra has overtaken also the, uh, either Mumbai, uh, Pune, or Thane singly. If you take each of them as single in state districts only, that therefore if you divide Maharashtra into Thane, Pune, Mumbai, and rest of Maharashtra, rest of Maharashtra is also, you know, today is uh, coming out uh, that it's, it seems to be going up pretty fast. Now, there again, if you look at which parts of Maharashtra this is happening, you'll find again that the pattern seems to be, it starts from Bombay, spreads to Thane, of course, Pune is independent, and then spreads to nearby districts. And of course, there are other towns in Maharashtra. You have Nagpur, you have Sholapur, or various other towns. So each of them could also become the focus of new infections. So if you want to really control the pandemic, it's very clear now, you have to go by district by district, see where which districts are coming up in your radar and take appropriate uh, action, which is as Kerala has talked time again, test, track and treat. This is the only way you can control the epidemic. And of course, we have to also see that when people fall ill, that the hospital system is able to take care of them. That means you must have capacity in the hospitals to take care of the seriously ill patients, not just the mild patients. Mild patients need to be removed from the general pool so they don't infect others. But it's really something which is more in terms of taking care to see that they don't become serious. If they do, then remove them to the hospital quickly, but also remove them from the rest of the population who they might otherwise in infect. Absolutely. So Absolutely. we are really in that kind of scenario. And of course, we have to see the last part of it, which is medicine. It's very clear that uh, the dexamethasone is something which is effective, particularly for very serious patients or for critical patients. And while there are these uh, drugs, which are basically what are called uh, monoclonal antibody drugs, which are patented, which are expensive to produce and do cost quite a lot. Those drugs also can, some of them do address inflammation, but dexamethasone is a cheap, widely available drug and can be very easily used. So the standard course of medi medication should be for critical blood thinning, heparin, which is also being done, and corticosteroid, of which dexamethasone has already proved itself in a drug trial. That should be our main focus. Remdesivir works in the first and second stage of the infection, not when the patient turns serious, because that's a different phenomena that comes up, the body's immune system itself attacking the body, or the clotting phenomena, which has also been seen. So at that stage, you really into other kinds of uh, treatment that is, being, that is being prescribed. Early stages, remdesivir has some effect, modest effect. At the same time, it should be made widely available. But unfortunately, government of India has kept absolutely mum what it intends to do about making remdesivir available to the people. It, in fact, seems to uh, believe that if it closes its eyes, the problem will somehow go away. Remdesivir is not available. As you know, Gilead has sold its stock for the next three months to the United States. It is in discussions with Indian companies, but since it had itself hoarded all the raw materials, how it can be quickly manufactured in the rest of the world, we have no idea. Neither have we from the government heard anything about this. So it does seem the government of India at the moment wants to follow the principle that Trump followed, the Trump is following, that the central government is not responsible for all of this. It's only the states which are responsible. And their task is to concentrate on external issues, banning apps, uh, TikTok, for example, and other such uh, distractions at the moment, rather than focus on the pandemic and seriously negotiate how we can have continuing peace on the borders. Fortunately, we do seem to be moving at least in that direction of peace withdrawals from the borders, from disputed territories. So tension doesn't take place right now and address the most burning question. But it does seem either on the medical front 
or on the simple front of what needs to be done. And don't forget, the central government has a disaster management act. It has arrogated to itself all the rights of, to intervene wherever and however it wants. But a lot of this now is being expended. Say against Vinod Dua, the notice was did talk about even the disaster management act. So we seem to be seeing the use of this, this powers in different ways. And don't forget also that while the police powers are exercised, it has consequences, as we saw, the two deaths that took place in Tutikodi, the police station, the case of uh, two victims. Jai, Jai Rajan Pillai. Violence. Yes. They, in fact, were charged with having kept the shop open 15 minutes more than the so-called pandemic or epidemic curfew. So this is the consequence of also arming yourself with all these draconian powers but then not using it for the benefit of the people, but to use it essentially as a law and order instrument. And that's a very blunt instrument for public health disaster, manage disasters or management of public health disasters. Right. So, Prabhupada, on a connected note, we saw that uh, Bank UP went into a 55 hour lockdown towards the end of last week. Bangalore is going into another one tomorrow. So are we also looking at a phase where key regions will keep continuously mm -hmm. doing the cycles of lockdowns and will they really have that kind of an impact? Well, you know, lockdown, as we have always said, is a very blunt instrument. It works only to buy you some time and to gear yourself up. But lockdown is not for the purpose of stopping the epidemic just by itself. Because if people are infected and you do not take them out of the general population, they will con continue to infect the families or at least some people they come in touch with. So it's a very, very clear issue that if you do not identify these people, don't stigmatize them, make it possible for them to come and be tested. And if they are tested or you do test them, then make it easy for them to be taken out of the population or providing facilities where they don't dread the idea of going and getting themselves locked up uh, as if they're in jail. So if you don't stigmatize this, make it possible for them to go into places where if they're not serious, they'll recover in five to six days and go back when they are free of not in, you know, of the infection, not infecting others, they reach that stage. So that will take care of actually the community spread. We are in community spread. There's no point in denying it. If you have so thousands of people getting infected without knowing where the infection is coming from, you say you're not in community uh, spread is just bogus. Mm -hmm. So this is the next step you have to take. And you have to be clear that when the numbers go up, your hospitals are going to be stressed, particularly the intensive care hospitals, a part of the hospital is going to be stressed. You must have intensive care facility in the hospitals. And also a lot of the hospitals seem to treat that you know, some wards are COVID wards, some wards are general ward. Now we know that the air conditioned ventilation system itself can actually transmit the aerosol from one ward to another. So unless these systems are disconnected, what is likely to happen is that you get a sudden large number of cases that will go up in the hospital itself. And of course the hospital employees in non-COVID wards are also going to get affected as well as the patients. So hospitals, in fact, can become the secondary spots of infection. So how do you order the hospital system in a way that this does not happen, that hospitals can take care of the serious cases? And that, that's how you keep your death figures low. It will not keep the infection low, but it will keep your death figures low. And that's the objective of this, this phase itself. Uh, itself, that you don't have too many deaths. Uh, though otherwise, you know, you would be in the same soup as the United States, where they're running out of now, I think in Houston, there are 40 ICUs are completely full. Now that's because the numbers have overtaken the capacity of the hospitals. And this one city in the US we are talking about, but we are also seeing some of these things happening in India. So how to strengthen that hospital system after you have taken care of the, of the others is really the issue. So at the same time, what you say, what else that we need to do? Of course, you also have to give uh, the rest of the people food and other uh, support. 
So that's also the task of the government. So I'm really at the moment in this discussion focusing more on the public health aspect of it. But let's um, understand that's only one part of it because not having food, not having income, not having education, the children at home, all of these are also problems. But if you talk about just the public health issue, because we don't control the pandemic, if we don't control the epidemic, let's not think that we can, the economy by itself will come back because people, and this is the example of Sweden. Sweden did not have lockdowns, as you know. They say we will develop herd immunity. The figures in Sweden, apart from the figures of death being much higher, the infections being much higher and so on, the important part is the Swedish economy has also contracted. They just couldn't keep it open either because people will take calls themselves even if the government doesn't. So all of this means that the economy can only be addressed when you have controlled the epidemic. The belief that this government, also the, the belief that Trump shares, what Sweden shared, that pandemic and economy are two different things. You can somehow separate the two and open the economy. The economy will start running even if there are infections, even if some people die, it doesn't matter. This whole belief is wrong. And as I said, Sweden, which started with this belief, is the clearest, clearest example. It's in fact the drop in the, uh, uh, the production figures, the GDP figures of Sweden, are as precipitate as that of its Scandinavian neighbor, neighbors who actually instituted lockdown. So lockdowns by themselves are only a palliative they are not the one destroying the economy, as people are trying to say. It's really the pandemic that needs to be controlled if we want normal life to come back and if we want normal economic activities to start. Thank you so much, Rupi. Our next segment is from the world of sport. The first test match post the pandemic concluded this week with the West Indies beating England. But what stood out was an eloquent and powerful statement by West Indies legend Michael Holding, who was also a commentator, on the first day where he talked about racism and the importance of education in combating it and building a better society. We talked to NewsClick's Leslie Xavier on this issue. Thank you, Leslie, for joining us. So the first test match after the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic continues, of course, but amid the lockdown, the first test match, test match got over, West Indies defeated England, and it was quite a heartening result in some senses also to see, the, also due to the fact that the match actually happened. But we do know that one of the aspects which got the most amount of attention was on the first day, Michael Holding's very impassioned speech about racism, about fighting against it, about the need for education itself as a key tool in combating racism and discrimination. So do you first want to talk a bit about the match itself, the context in which it was held and Holding's speech in that way? So yeah, the, it's great. Uh, it was a great West Indies with the overall performance was great uh, and it considering the fact that they came in under st strict quarantine rules and uh, completely isolated themselves strained and uh, so and the kind of strain that it takes on 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 the psyche as well as the physical side as well and still they came out and performed away from home and uh, did well to win so that's it's it's commendable right. but uh, uh, like I said, like you said earlier, I mean, at the start, uh, the talking point of this uh, entire test match, besides the fact that it's the restart of cricket, was, of course, the larger moment that is happening across the world, uh, Black Lives Matter. And so the players started off the match uh, 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 by taking a knee and also the uh, right through both sides, the English board as well as the West Indies cricket board, both of them have been very open as to where they stand as an organization in this in this moment. They were completely uh, for people to stand up against it. They allowed the players to completely express it. So on the jerseys, they had, they had logos displaying Black Lives Matter. They had, West Indies players came out with a, uh, one black gloves in their hand, which is uh, a tribute to the 1968 Olympics podium uh, right. protests that, that American athletes Tommy Smith had, had, had done. So uh, before that, before the match even started, there was a rain delay uh, and that's when uh, Michael Holding came on, on air and spoke uh, very passionately, very emotionally. He almost was on tears about racism and 
uh, about the things that he has faced, he has not faced, and about the regrets that he have of not having stood up when when things were happening around him. Just because he was an athlete, he was uh, he was known, and he thought that this doesn't directly impact us. But over the years, he he said that all the atrocities that he keeps seeing around, including the latest George Floyd's death, which has been the triggering point for the mass movement. Uh, and he is just it has just built up and it just he says that he can't be mute anymore. He can't be right. he can't stand aside and say it doesn't directly affect me. And to his speech he seemed to convey also the fact that we shouldn't be waiting that much years to react. It's now it's the time has to start from now. And the key point that he mentioned was education being key. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Incidentally, again I'm just uh, getting into that that part. Uh, the same thing applies on a different context in the Indian Indian exactly. Indian system of education because it's 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 as we know over the over the years uh, with with the kind of political influence that has that has affected the education sector the curriculum the syllabus planning everything it has mm-hmm. it has been diluted the the larger picture of complete and full education that we had probably at some point in our history. Is 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 getting lost, and uh, so uh, when Holding was uh, speaking uh, in England, the same day uh, in, over in India, the CBSE made its move, which is which which created a lot of uproar by exactly. cancelling. So uh, interesting, yeah. They cancel and they cancel. Uh, things like democracy, secularism, right, right, right. right to food, things like that. So right. it's it's very clear where it comes from. It's it's very clear what the agenda is. And here, the, across the world, one great uh, cricketer is talking about racism and how systematic education presenting both sides of the of the I mean the complete picture, so to speak, of history of everything of polity, everything that happens around the world, right. uh, and then then empowering the generations to come with the knowledge to to lead a I mean non discriminative egalitarian mm-hmm. society, mm-hmm. and over in India, which is the biggest democracy in the world, I mean still I would like to believe, uh, but. Things are happening far from far, far from far from the, such a system. So that's that's unfortunate and that's sad. Right, exactly. So the other key question, of course, is that there's a larger question of the education system, and then there's also the question of the kind of role sports plays in education. So of course we've uh, we've all grown up playing sports in various ways. Uh, right now, it's far more professional in some senses, whereas maybe a couple of decades ago, it was a much more amateur thing. And there is there is a common understanding that sports is very essential for education, but it's still a very vague kind of principle. So could you talk a bit about that aspect also, especially in the context of what Holding spoke about and how can that kind of can even get channelized a bit more in a place like India? So, so I would again go back to Holding to start get into this conversation and then address both the sides, the amateur side, the education side of sport, in fact three sides and the professional side of course. So Holding mentioned when he was asked at a later conversation on Sky Sports News when, when the news anchor discussed with him about his speech earlier and many aspects of what made him say so. Holding mentioned, uh, he was asked whether he faced racism on the cricket field as a player. So he was very clear that from the cricketing fraternity, from the players, he never faced any racism. Of course, sledging, things like that, like for instance, Holding is best, uh, I mean, one of his most famous point in his career is the Grovel series, they call it, when the South, I mean, uh, during the England tour. Uh, the English captain had mentioned that I would make the West Indians Grovel, and then we all know who Grovel eventually. And uh, so, uh, but but these are, I mean, uh, uh, beyond that, beyond this obvious, uh, I mean, uh, digging at each other, they call it sledging in cricket parlance. Uh, he has not faced any serious racism at, at, at all, he said, and he said that he wouldn't have stood for it. But being on the field, being on the sidelines, being on the boundary lines, 
the amount of stuff that he has faced, the abusive languages, the racist slurs, he said he, you can't imagine. Right. So that is, from there I would like to bring the role of sport because your sport brings brings up these sports persons to a certain system right from the grassroots, right from the school days where they start playing the game with friends in the classroom. So sport becomes part of that education system over there. So from there, it imbibes certain values, which, which is something that Holding was uh, b believing in that over time with the right education, the society will reach a point where you are judged by merit and not by the color of your skin or your race or your religion. Right. So uh, the, the sport teaches that because sport is purely merit based. I mean, uh, in practice, of course, we know there is nepotism, there are things like that, but uh, largely sport teaches you that life is merit based. Sport teaches you equality, sport teaches you teamwork, sport teaches you to respect each other's strengths and right. play with those strengths to for a larger good, for the larger goal of the team, which translates to working towards the larger good of the society. So these are values that sport and beyond competition, beyond uh, physical education, beyond fitness, things like that. These are the values that get imbibed if sport becomes part of a uh, larger curriculum of, of primary and secondary education in the country. Right. Right. Uh, sadly, if you look at the education system, and I can talk about this uh, being an insider because I was part of the school sports system as a competitor. Mm -hmm. I was part of the school sports system as an organizer of sport because I was, I had a small teaching stint. Though my subject was science, I because of my sports background, I used to invariably get involved in organizing sport. So in, in school sport, in, in the educational scenario of sport in India, it, it largely revolves around the competition system only. So, and so it's not a universal idea of sport for everyone. Right. It is for those few students who are sports persons who are into sport and they would be allowed the luxury of, it's a, it's a luxury, but, but I would say it's a necessity because the kind of uh, larger goals that it, it uh, larger values that it imbibes into 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 the psyche of the students it's 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 immense and this is for I, I spoke just about the uh, societal part of it but on a personal front also the kind of influences that playing in sport and uh, interacting with 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 peers introduces into the into the mind into the psyche into the personality of the person it's 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 well studied and we all know what uh, it is and getting into again the other aspect of it this uh, the non-education part of it sport as a professional establishment uh, around sport around the playing field there is a lot of instances of inequality and racism happening because it's a cutthroat world and also when I mentioned holding facing racist slurs from the fans and all that so similar thing happens across the world across sport football be it football cricket uh, rugby any any sport for that matter discrimination is there but uh, not necessarily within the system but around the system and so recently we at newsclick also published a report which which cited a study saying how uh, commentary for instance football commentary is as a lot of subtle racism right. within it right. so and it's 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 racial stereotyping where you mention some uh, black, uh, uh, certain players of certain ethnicity, for instance, black players have, I mean, physicality or they are prone to fouling, the, uh, things like that. They're, they're prone to cheat. So the same thing that translates where, uh, where when a black person walks into a uh, shopping mall and you, he is continuously monitored because they think that he might be stealing. The same thing applies here because referees look at players of certain ethnicity with, without saying that, yeah, he, he is likely to comment. Right. So, so that kind of racial stereotyping and all this are part of sport either. So sport isn't perfect. That's what I'm trying to say here. But sport at a, at a ground level, at the purest of form where all these professional strappings and uh, competition uh, scenarios and right. uh, the gains and the, the economic impacts and all these things are taken out when sport is played purely as a as a exertion for fun and for 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 camaraderie and for
for Absolutely. part of the education in school and all that. It's 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 as perfect as you can imagine it it, it should be. Right. Thank you so much, Leslie, for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. We'll be back tomorrow with major news developments from the country. Until then, keep watching News Click.